uh, introduce our next speaker for, for certain. Uh, Dr. Steve Cannon, uh, during his research postdoctoral fellowship, Dr. Cannon made a fundamental discovery of the sodium channel defect that causes susceptibility to periodic paralysis. Chairing the Department of Physiology at UCLA, Dr. Cannon's research focus is upon speak loudly, you didn't want me to blast. So I'm really happy to be here. This is my fourth uh, PPA meeting, so it's kind of like uh, coming home for me. And I learn a lot from you every time I come here. So this, for us who have spent our lives studying this disease, trying to understand it and help people, there's so much misinformation out there, even in the peer-reviewed medical literature, that I learn more of the truth every time I come and talk to you. And it really helps Activity and you know light, sound, touch, everything. And this is fascinating. And you know, it, it probably a component I think is truly due to the problems with muscle function. And this job bringing you Caveus and been working with them, uh, understanding just what periodic paralysis is all about. So that's been great. I have a couple of slides I threw in again from uh, the discussion yesterday. So there's a lot of talk about stress and adrenaline. And in the context of hypo-PP, I agree with a lot of the comments that were made, which is that your own body's adrenaline that's released from your adrenal glands uh, can be a problem for shifting K into muscles and causing an attack. But there are a lot of people out here with lanyards that are other colors for hyper-PP. And actually, adrenergic stimulation, such as with salbutamol, which is a drug used often for asthma and related conditions, can actually be helpful in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Here's one very nice publication from Mike Hanna's group. So, of course, there in hyper-PP, what you want to do is lower the K, shift it into muscle will help. And stimulating the, the pump uh, actually helps recharge the electrical activity on the cells. So a lot of people used uh, beta adrenergic drugs in the 60s and 70s, and it fell out of disuse because after a couple of weeks of being on the medication, it sort of wore off, and people weren't get, no longer getting benefit. So that's why it sort of fell out of favor. Here's just an example. We don't need to go into details, but uh, this is actually a muscle response from a patient with hyper-PP, and this is just the voltage of the cell here. And when they give adrenaline, the voltage gets more negative, which is helpful, just, just showing uh, it can help. Um, on the other hand, again, it, you know, the details, the devil's in the details. It matters whether you have hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So this is a classic paper from way back in 1965 with Andrew Engel and his group at the Mayo Clinic, who were some of the thought leaders on uh, periodic paralysis. And this is a really old paper, and it didn't reproduce well. But what you're seeing is over days here on the x-axis, uh, the um, muscle force response, uh, the Caesar can controls. And whoops, the other is a patient with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. And what you can see is this massive decline when they've administered intravenous adrenaline into the arm with the tourniquet on, on these patients. So I just wanted to give you hard medical evidence. There's no doubt that adrenaline uh, is a problem, epinephrine, things like that, if you have hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And here is some of the best data in the medical literature. So again, it's a differential effect depending on whether you have hypo or hyper. So we'll see how we do on time. I want to tell you about some you know, really new advances in research. There's no quiz after this, so you don't have to take a lot of notes. 
Uh, and we might run out of time, and that's okay because there's no quiz if we don't get to all the topics. But um, what I, what I want to do is, first of all, give you a sense, because now that we're on the West here, I think there are a lot of people that hadn't been to some of the other meetings of just what goes on with research in periodic paralysis. And you're hearing, you know, you're touching a lot of pieces of the elephant, as Mickey Siegel said. And you're going to hear from a lot of different folks at this meeting, which is great. Um, so Lou Tachek is, uh, was one of the really um, shakers and movers of identifying mutations in the first place. But what our lab does is try to figure out what's the consequence of having one of these mutations. So what we do, and that's a picture of my wife, by the way, what we do is uh, take one of these mutations that's been identified and introduce it into a piece of DNA in the lab, DNA that has the message for how to make a channel. And so we recreate your mutation in a test tube. And then we use some tricks to get either cells in culture or those white things, those little balls are eggs from frogs. And we can inject these messages into these model systems. And they will very beautifully just make channels for us. Whatever channel we tell them to make, biology will do it. It reads the DNA code. And then that gives us the opportunity with some very sensitive instruments to measure the little electrical events in these cells and see if there's a difference between what a normal sodium or calcium channel does and what one of the ones with one of your mutations. So what we do is try to functionally establish whether one of these genetic variants or modifications really has a functional impact on the way the channel behaves. Because it's essential to really establish cause and effect for you've got a DNA variant, are you going to be susceptible to periodic paralysis? So just to give you a sense, and we're not going to go over these traces, but we just we measure them, then what we do I have a background in engineering as well. We construct mathematical models of excitability of skeletal muscle so that we can quantitatively interpret the consequence of these misbehaving channels. And what that does is it helps us establish mechanism of disease and again, really cause and effect, not just, well, it kind of looks like this. Yeah, it sounds reasonable to actually put numbers on it and show that this makes sense. Because what that does, by putting numbers on it, you can get a sense of how large a change would you need to make if you want to have an effective intervention, which is you know, a critical, and that's the point of doing the whole thing. So there's this feedback loop that, based on these models, which might seem esoteric and difficult to understand, those are really providing the insights on what would be reasonable approaches, uh, certainly for symptomatic management. So this is the way the field went for about the first 10 years. So this started around 1990. So until the early 2000s, this is what people were doing. And this was the primary approach. What then has happened is uh, technologies to introduce gene mutations into living animals, not just cells in a dish. So you can genetically uh, engineer mice. And we have made three different types of mice, one with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and two with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And so one of the advantages, now you can see you know, how do these channels misbehave when they're actually in the muscle of a mammal rather than in a frog egg or some crazy system? Because, you know, one of the concerns is, well, one of the changes you see might be an artifact because it's a very, you know, artificial system. So here we've been able to, you know, confirm indeed what the behavior is of the altered channels. But what's more important is now you have a model system where you can actually measure muscle performance. So you can look at things like the amount of force these muscles can generate, what happens when you challenge them with high or low potassium, with glucose, with exercise, and we can directly measure the electrical excitability of these muscle fibers. So this has been an absolutely fantastic development in the tools to try to understand periodic paralysis and, and, and answer specific questions. And so, of course, this feeds back on itself, and we're now using these mouse systems to test therapies from which the idea originally came from understanding the channel defects and the mutations. And of course, the bottom line of all this research is to get the message out, which is why I'm here and why I'm so excited. Because if we do all this and you don't hear about it and your doctors don't hear about it, it's, there's no value to it, right? So my goal today is, is to get you excited about this and to get you know a lot of things are happening and what's, what's right around the corner. So I have five topics. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them, but it doesn't matter. I'm here through Sunday. We can always fire them up again if we need more time. 
So the first one I want to um, tell you about is, uh, I, you know, this meeting, it's been sort of hypo-PP centric. And um, one of the reasons is the hyper-PP story and the scientific basis for that was really well developed in the 90s. And hypo-PP was just a black box mystery. Louis Tatchek, sitting back there, found the first hypo-PP mutation in the calcium channel in 1994. And it took yeah, 10, 12 years before anybody could figure out, well, why does that cause the problem? So hypo-PP was a much more difficult problem to understand. And in the last five years, we've made a lot of advances. And so that's where a lot of focus of the research is and the therapy. And so I'm, I'm apologizing for the, I mean, hyper-PP is equally important, of course. But one of the interesting things and the challenges was that the first mutation was found in the calcium channel. And for several years, actually for six years, all of the mutations that had been identified were in the calcium channel. So the story was, if you had a calcium channel mutation, you have hypo-PP. If you have a sodium channel mutation, you have hyper-PP. And the world was simple and everything was nice. Uh, but then, uh, in a group in Canada, Angelica Hahn was the neurologist, um, working with Dennis Bowman, who was the geneticist, had a big family, multi-generations, lots of affected people, that was clearly hypo-PP. I mean, just classical. And there was no mutation in the calcium channel. Kind of a scenario you all face, you know, nobody can find my mutation. And so they went to the work and said, well, let's just do the sodium channel. And they found a mutation. And that was the opening floodgate. And as you heard from Mickey, you know, is now, you know, 20% of all cases of hypokalemic periodic paralysis have a sodium channel mutation. And so these are the cartoons. And again, I don't want this to be too sciencey and uninterpretable. These cartoons, the bar represents like the membrane of the cell and down below is the inside and up above is the outside. So these channels, these things sit in the membrane. It's to help let these salts get across the membrane. And what these strings represent, you know, um, channels like all proteins are made of amino acids like uh, pearls, a string of pearls. And there are 2,000 pearls on these strings for either the sodium or the calcium channel. And we're talking about just one of the wrong pearl being put in causing uh, either hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. But what was interesting from the genetics and had the physiologist stumped, I mean, I can't tell you how many of my graduate students crashed and burned uh, trying to express the calcium channel and figure out what's going wrong. And what was helpful is that the sodium channel for technical reasons, it's much easier to work with in the lab and to trick these frog eggs and other cells to make sodium channels for you so you could study them. So we were all excited. It's like, okay, now we have hypo-PP in a channel that we can actually study. And so um, uh, we did that, uh, sorry, went too fast, by putting it in these frog eggs, hooking it up to a bunch of fancy instruments. And I don't expect you to know the details of this, but you can see just gestalt, the difference between these little squiggles in black for a normal sodium channel and one with hypo-PP, these lines are farther apart. That means the currents are bigger. Um, and uh, Frank Weber was alluding to this. So what happens is the mutant sodium channels are leaky. Uh, this is voltage versus current. So more negative means more sodium leaking into these eggs. So we had uh, our first hint and it related back to um, uh, what, oh, sorry, got to go the other direction. What um, Frank Weber was telling you is there's this amazing coincidence that there are 19 published mutations for hypokalemic periodic paralysis in the two channels. And 18 out of 19 are at the same type of pearl, the same flavor, the same amino acid. They're all at arginine, these R's, and they're all in the voltage sensor. So there's no way that's just coincidence. And so that led us to think, well, maybe this explains why mutation of either the sodium or the calcium channel can give you the same clinical symptoms, right? These two channels do very different things in muscle. As Dr. Weber was explaining to you, the sodium channel is responsible for the electrical excitability, the action potential. The calcium channel is responsible for triggering the release of calcium inside the cell that helps actually the mechanical development of force. So they do, whoa, they do two very different things. And so the question is, why would you end up with the same clinical problems 
if you're disrupting channels that do two very different things. H how in the world could that happen? But looking at this cartoon and just, you know, sitting back and thinking about it, there's this parallel structure to the types of mutations. They're all arginines, they're all in the same spot. We've found that if you put this in a sodium channel, it causes a leak. And in fact, uh, our lab and others, we've tested now nine of the 10 sodium channel mutations associated with hypopp, and all nine were leaky, every single one. So that gives us confidence that we're on the right track because otherwise it would just, each mutation would cause something different. But there's a consistency to the problem. So the $64,000 question was, will the mutant calcium channels do the same thing? Because that could explain why these two very, very different channels give you the same clinical symptoms. They're both leaky. They both cause the same kind of problematic leak. So the challenge, this takes us up to now about 2005 to 2008, we still didn't have a good way to express uh, calcium channels in model systems and study them conveniently. So we did the tough thing and made a mouse. So we introduced the R528H mutation. It's the most common cause of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So we engineered this into a mouse, and this mouse has hypopp, this beautiful model for hypopp. Having this mouse available made it possible now to see if there was a leak. And there was a leak. So the, the open white symbols, sorry, are the normal mouse and the black are the, um, from the animal. So this was, this was great because it says, you know, we're probably on the right track here. There are leaks in both of these channels. The leaks are very similar. So of course you would immediately want to know, well, what about the other nine mutations in the calcium channel? Do they all cause leaks? Because uh, this would give us uh, great confidence that we're really on the right track. Well, it'd be a lot of work to make those nine mice. It takes, even with new technology, it takes about a year to make one mouse. You got to breed them up, you know, about every 21 days or something, they have litters and um, the housing costs. I mean, we spend tens of thousands of dollars in our mouse colony. So it's not trivial to just make another mouse. Fortunately, um, what well, what happened is uh, uh, in the last year, a new, we had a new tool in our tool chest. So again, when we tried to put calcium channels in eggs, uh, we have this very boring graph, which is flat, showing nothing, because you couldn't see anything. There was nothing detectable. If you amplify stuff 100 times, there's some little tiny stuff way below the signal to noise level to be able to detect whether or not there was a leak. About three years ago, there was another piece of the calcium channel discovered. What you need to understand is the actual channel, the thing that makes a pore in the membrane, is actually several proteins coming together. It's a whole clump. And while this uh, CAV 1.1 alpha subunit is the big main important part that forms the actual pore, there are other accessory proteins. And the, click, the trick was this accessory protein. It's called STAC3, it's not important. But the important thing that I want you to take home is not understanding what the heck these curves mean, but this, we changed from a flat line where there was nothing to measure to these big, rich, beautiful, curvy lines, which means that with this trick, the calcium channels are expressing like gangbusters and frog eggs, and now we can quickly screen and see whether all the other hypopp uh, mutations cause a leak. And, um, Here's the classic one, the R528H, and sure enough, it has a leak. We've also shown that for the R528G, uh, for this uh, R897S. Uh, so the, the, uh, the votes are starting to come in, and everything is saying you were on the right track. To tell you how fast this is moving, there's a paper that came out yesterday in the Journal of Physiology where a group in France, Bruno Allard and Lyon, uh, used a different trick to uh, inject uh, DNA into a live mouse and have the cells take it up, uh, not permanently, that where you can pro uh, have it in the offspring. But they went back and measured, and again, here's the separation of these two curves. We keep showing this, this portrait. And he found the leak as well. And so um, stuff that's unpublished, I can tell you every single one of these has a leak. So we're really excited now that um, this is truly the important defect that we need to think about. Uh, you think about 
uh, drug development and so forth, the, the magic bullet, if you could find a small molecule that plugs this leak, uh, you'd all be really happy. Okay. So we're looking for that as well as others. One of the challenges is this is still a very labor-intensive cell-by-cell, egg-by-egg screening process. So in the jargon, it's not yet one of these so-called high-throughput systems where you could test thousands of small molecules to see if you could find it. But those are the kinds of things we're working on. So that's the first point. Anybody have any questions about that? So, yes. Um, can you, just, you said the amino acid. What was, what yeah. So, great question. What, what's this with amino acid? So, the sequence is, you know, these channels are proteins. Proteins are long strands of individual amino acids, 20 different amino acids, like pearls on the string. And depending on which amino acid, the chemistry of those amino acids changes the way this folds up. And everything about the way proteins work is about their shape and who they stick to and who they bind to. And so the interesting thing in hypopp, actually I left, I'm glad you asked that question because I left out part of the story, um, <laughs> um, is all of the amino acid substitutions were at arginines. They were always arginines that were having a mistake. But there's one outlier here, this little V, uh, which is valine. And so this was like, you know, the exception that breaks the rule. Uh, you guys found some interesting stuff, but you don't have the whole story yet. Well, Bruno Allard studied this, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying it because it's been publicly in abstract and it's submitted for publication. Um, that has a leak as well. So even the ones that look atypical in terms of consistency of which amino acid is affected, the functional consequence is holding true. It's always a leak. Okay, great question. Yeah. 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 So the question is, what is the leak exactly? And the point is, as you've heard from Frank Weber this morning, cells are very peculiar and persnickety about who gets in and who doesn't. That's all about what's on the inside and what isn't. And um, curiously, these leaks are pathways where salts can come in and out. The, they're not supposed to use that pathway. That was the alpha versus omega that Frank was alluding to. So this is not a leak through the normal pore. It's a completely different part of the molecule that isn't supposed to be a pore. But because the wrong amino acid is there, the fit isn't correct geometrically, and now things like sodium can leak in. In some cases, hydrogen ions, protons leak in. We know potassium can leak out. So the leaks are things like sodium, potassium, and protons. Chloride is another interesting thing. Maybe we'll circle back to that one. But these, these, all of these have been leaky to positively charged things, cations, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, not negatively charged things like chloride, which is an anion. Okay. Yeah, another question. So the question was um, symptomatic but not yet identified mutation. Also, one of our episodes associated with low magnesium. What might that mean, one or both channels, or does that help us? Um, interestingly, a, a lot of the other ions like magnesium uh, have very powerful effects on channels and membranes because it's a dense two charges. And we know that, for instance, zinc and barium, which are other ions with two positive charges on them, blocks some of these leaks, partially blocks. So it's conceivable that whatever is going on in your case is a leak that's somewhat sensitive to the amount of magnesium. It's open possibility. Yeah. Oh, all right, go ahead, yeah. Um, I have a variant in the calcium channel. I have a variant in the calcium channel, yet it's hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Yep. Would you speak to that? Because yeah. Great, I great question. And what it really brings together is the fact that when you want to understand this, you really need an integrated approach to consider all the players. So the question is, you know, I have hypopp, hypokpp. So the K is in there. It's my symptoms. I have to take K to feel good. My K is low when I get an attack. 
but I have a mutation in a calcium channel. Well, it looks like we just switched teams there, right? And um, the story is, um, and I can show you offline later if you want, that what these leaks do is they make you more at risk of your muscle paradoxically losing its excitability when your potassium is low. This is what Frank Weber was referring to. And so it doesn't matter what the leak is coming from, from a sodium channel, from a calcium channel, because you put an artificial thing in the membrane. If you have a nonspecific leak and you take into account all the players that determine the resting state of your muscle to have it be ready, available to be excited, these leaks will cause this phenomenon of in low potassium you strangely depolarize to occur. So this happens even in normal muscle, which actually Frank was showing. So that was part of how we figured this out, that the mutations aren't creating something entirely new that doesn't happen to all of us, but the potassium to which you would need to go for this to occur, you can do it in the dish, in the lab, you'd be dead to go that low in a normal person and cause the paradoxical muscle depolarization. So what all these leaks do, no matter where they come from, is they change the threshold of what, how low does the K need to be before I'm gonna get this problem. So that's the tie between leak and potassium, and it doesn't matter which channel the leaks in. Great questions, guys. Yeah. So I don't want to complicate anything or go in a different direction. Um, I was just curious. I know there's, there's a lot of talk within our community about the ATS, the anderson tawil syndrome. Um, and my very brief understanding is it's really kind of about the shift, which is what I was getting from what you were just saying. It's that our sensitivity to that shift is because of the leaks, where somebody who's healthy would need a greater shift, right? Does that? Yeah, yes, so it's interesting, and the insights that come from you guys, it's unbelievable. So ATS is a completely different problem. So rather than being a leak, it's a potassium channel that doesn't work. So the potassium channel makes currents flow in the opposite direction as the leak. So the potassium is what's helping you deal with the leak. And so you can get the same problem, you know, two sides of the coin, either too much leak or not enough potassium current that the leak is fighting. And so in the ATS situation, you don't have enough potassium current. Louis Potacek found that mutation. You got the rock star over there in the corner. So, um, but that's what's going on in that situation. It's not a leak. It's the absence of a potassium It's current. not a tumor. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cannon, you mentioned zinc and barium. I I is there any evidence of So we study these um, ions uh, from a scientific perspective of understanding the nature of the leak to try to give us some clues as to what small molecules that you could actually take as a medication might work. So this was sort of proof of principle, but the levels that we're using of these things, you couldn't achieve in your body. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I would say keeping a healthy level of these, um, of things like zinc and magnesium, which you have a, a very little zinc, but more magnesium in the body is good and important. Um, but going hog wild on it, I would not recommend. It's not that you're gonna make the situation better. Um, two questions, one was, uh, uh, is the leak for hypo and hyper? No, so it turns out none of the hyper mutations cause leaks, and that's why the symptoms that you get, so with myotonia and hyperkalemic, are completely different because even though it's the same channel, it's the sodium channel, those mutations are in different locations of the channel, and they have different consequences. So again, Frank Weber was alluding to this, but those mutations cause the rules of when the normal, proper pore is open or closed. So it's regulation of the normal pore that's messed up and it's too much sodium coming in for hyper PP. So we're bad with our terms. In a sense, they're leaky. They're letting too much sodium in, but it's a different magnet through the normal pore of the gates messed up versus the hypo PP leaks are this abnormal conduction pathway that just shouldn't even be there in the first place. It's a very bizarre thing. So it's a problem with the terminology. So it's like a side, it's like a side door. It's a whole side door for hypo PP. Right. For hyper, it's the normal pathway, but its regulation is messed up. Do your mice live long enough to get PMW? Great question. So um, 
The hypopp mice we've kept alive for two years, which is pretty aged for a mouse. And um, for informal, just looking at them running around the cage, no. Interesting, the hyperpp mouse, which is the M1592V, if anyone's keeping score, uh, it's the second most common cause of hyperpp. Those mice drag their legs as they get old, their hind legs. And we're trying to understand what's going on. I mean, obviously, this is the, the next wave of where we need to go in periodic paralysis to understand, but we, we don't have understanding yet. I, I think we should, <clears throat> we'll, we'll move yeah. on. And then, yeah. and then uh, you know, we have Sunday basically kind of all day, yeah. so maybe yeah. we'll just continue. Well, so I have these five topics, and we can, we, some of them are in gray and hard to read, but we can, we can select what you want to hear now, because we have about another half hour. Um, I'll tell you what, let's take a vote. Let's just do it that way. So we have some insights about why exercise might trigger attacks in hypopp, which we can talk about. We have a little follow-up on this drug bumetanide I talked about uh, at the last meeting and how that can help in some cases of hypo but not hyperpp. There are new muscle diseases that are being discovered that are caused by sodium channel mutations, and then there's just a one slide of new disease genes in hypopp. Any of those? Triggering, or I can just go in order. <laughs> Everybody wants new disease gene, okay, which is the last thing. And, but that's okay, because it's the shortest one, so it's easy to do. Uh, and it's just a follow-up. Again, Frank, we're all on the same page. Faber told you about this. And here it is. So um, this was shared. It's unpublished. I'm sure Mike Hanna's group wouldn't mind because it's been in a public forum. So, you know, Mike Hanna's group at the University College in London is one of the uh, major centers for channelopathies. Emma Matthews has been working with him for a number of years. And they came across uh, an individual who had more things than just periodic paralysis, developmental delay, learning disability, seizures with uh, fever at four months of age, but then began having recurrent episodes of weakness since age two during one of these attacks, the potassium was clearly low. It was 2.4. And when they administered potassium, uh, he improved. And um, no, however, oops, what's wrong with my slide advance here? Computers thinking are doing something. Uh, I've seen the last lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we locked up. Oh. I don't know what happened. I'll just try launching the same slide again. OK, there we go. So they screened all the usual candidates, didn't find anything. Uh, in the research capacity, they can do what's called a whole exome sequencing, which means uh, sequence the coding regions of all the genes. And they found a mutation in a pump, as Frank Weber told you. It's a particular um, variant of the sodium potassium ATPase. This is the pump that charges your batteries, essentially, makes the potassium low. Uh, outside and high on the inside of cells. And it was a point mutation right here, which is the shaded area. That's where the membrane is. This is the outside and the inside. The interesting thing is they made this mutant pump, injected it into frog eggs, and measured what happened. And the pump doesn't quite work as well, which could be one reason. But what got me excited is it created a leak. So now you have not only channels, but pumps causing leaks. So I'm betting my money on the leak is the problem. So any protein that sits in the membrane and goes across the membrane is at risk for accidentally causing a leak. And that's what this pump has done. So that's, that's what I think is going on. So of course, when they saw this, they got excited and said, well, we have a freezer full of 25% you know, of our cohort of patients, we don't have a mutation identified yet. Let's quickly screen them all and see if there are other sodium potassium ATPase pump mutations. They didn't find any. So this is likely to be a very, very rare cause of periodic paralysis. But, and it's periodic paralysis plus. Because other mutations in the pump have caused things like the um, hemiplegic migraine and things like that, and, and other seizures and other effects of the brain. So I would propose this is an N of 1. But this boy's uh, problems with developmental delay, learning disability, and so forth are probably also likely to be the pump, because this pump is not just in skeletal muscle. Okay. So it was a, a brief story about other genes. Okay. Uh, so we can go back to either exercise, bumetanide, or exercise. exercise. Okay. So 
Um, and I think this will probably take us to the end. I think timing will be good. So we've been curious, as others have, about the connection between exercise and triggering attacks of weakness. After all, you know, you can control your diet, you can take potassium, but, you know, if you're a kid, you want to run around, you want to dance, you want to be in sports, you got to go to work, you got to climb a flight of stairs in the airport. So you can't just say, oh, avoid exercise, right? So we really need to understand this better uh, to make improvements. So we started, we, our lab, started thinking about what might be going on here based on what you have told us. So we started from the fact that, and I'd be curious to know if there are variants, and that for the most part, the exercise that's the trigger um, during the event, actually muscle strength is pretty well preserved as long as you keep going and keep moving. And I'm sure there are going to be differences in the room. We, we can talk about those. But what I'd like to do is think about sticking with the core phenomenon as it occurs in individuals for whom a mutation has been found so we know what we're dealing with. Of course, the symptoms are equally important in everybody. But if the cause hasn't been found yet, it might be a totally different reason and we don't want to get our wires crossed. So thinking about individuals with periodic paralysis with an identified mutation, for the most part, they tell me exercise, during exercise things are co, it comes after exercise, after a delay. So you play a game of basketball, you jump on the couch, by the time the first commercial comes on, you're starting to feel weak. Okay? The other is that it's more likely to happen if you're bout of exercise was very vigorous and prolonged, so more than 15 or 20 minutes. So long duration, um, high intensity exercise is a greater risk for the attack. So these were the things we were thinking of. And of course, the challenge is muscle adapts beautifully to increased demand that occurs with exercise. And a whole lot of things change, which is good. That improves our performance, but it makes it a challenge to figure out what the heck's going on. We decided to just focus on one thing, which is the fact that when you exercise a lot, the fuels that you burn in the muscle, the sugars, has trouble keeping up and oxidizing all that and burning it. You get lactic acid buildup and your muscle's pH goes down. You get acid, acid production. And after all, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, you know, acetazolamide, caveus, they're affecting the equilibration of acids across a member. So, you know, maybe there's something going on here. So we decided to follow up on the acid story. And we thought, let's be modest first and you know, not swing for the fences and just get the whole answer. And we wanted to follow up, is acidosis, is having acid around protective? Because people don't get an attack during an episode. And Frank Lehman Horn, back in the 70s, was studying, doing contractile studies on biopsies from patients with periodic paralysis. And they were interested in this as well. And they showed some preliminary heroic data that if you make the bath more acid, you could rescue the force in these uh, fibers from patients with periodic paralysis. I say heroic because, of course, the availability of those specimens, it's extraordinarily rare. So you know, all of us who do science, it's all about reproducibility and lots of, you, get, you get one shot and, and that's it. So my hat's off to Frank. But he showed that. So we thought, let's do this in our mouse model. So we've made uh, two hypo-PP mice, one with a sodium channel mutation, one with a calcium channel mutation. And we can take the muscle out of the hind limb and uh, I'm trying to get my mouse, haha, <laughs> here it is, um, in this little water bath, in front of this green strip here, there's this pink thing. That's the muscle from the hind leg of a mouse, tied with sutures, suspended in this little jar so that we can apply an electrical shock and measure the contraction of the muscle. And this just shows hypo-PP in this arrangement. So in this inset, you're seeing, as a function of time, the muscle force on a very fast time scale. This is like half a second. So we're applying shocks and measuring the force. So this increase here, sorry, this amount, is the force going up. Sorry, I just lost, here it is. Going up, and then we turn off the electricity and the force comes back down. This plus plus means this is a wild type mouse, two normal copies of the gene. And we measure the force, and then we lower the potassium. Instead of being 4.7, we lower it to 2. Those of you with hypo-PP know 2 would be a bad number to be at. And normal muscle tolerates that pretty well. That's the red trace. So it gets a little weaker, but not too bad. 
If you take one of our mutant mice that has one copy of the mutant gene, uh, this is actually from the sodium channel mouse, what happens now is if you put it in low K, there's a much bigger drop in the force. So this is an attack of hypopp in a dish. We can actually breed our mice and cross them and get mice where both copies of the sodium or the calcium channel have a mutation. So you've got a double whammy, two times the leak. So first of all, their baseline force isn't as high. And if you challenge these mice with low potassium, it just falls through the roof. They get nothing. So all I'm showing you so far is that we have a model system where we can have hypopp in a dish and now with our mouse model and now begin to ask questions about exercise. So our first thought was maybe this acidosis thing is protective because when you're vigorously exercising, you don't get an attack. So what I'm showing, these are the same data. What I'm plotting in this next thing is the amplitude of the force. How big is the muscle force? Are you able to maintain that relative to the control value before you give the potassium challenge? So in our mice, without doing any exercise or any pH change, this is over two hours now. So every dot is once every two minutes, we measure how good is the force in this mouse muscle. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We're testing two different muscles from the two different hind limbs at the same time. We put in low potassium, the force falls down uh, and then recovers. This has been at rest with normal um, pH, normal acid. The way we do the acid trick is just like in your body, you have bicarbonate. That's part of the acid base balance. There's bicarbonate in our bath. We just bubble in more carbon dioxide and it makes it more acid. So we simulated rest versus exercise. So before the K challenge, we made the whole system a little acidotic. And then we gave the K challenge. And you see I drew the dashed lines, so the drop in force is a little less. So there was some protection. So you know there might be something there going on to it. You know, maybe it's protective. But then, uh, this is one of these aha things in science, we kept recording. And when we turned off the high CO2, that is, made the acid go away or equivalently make the muscle come back to rest, there was this consistent little drop in force. Even though you had previously recovered and even though you're at normal K. And so this piqued our interest because here is a loss of force after exercise, right? That's what you all get. So we started by looking for protection and instead we got a hint that maybe the acidosis puts you at risk for when you recover, like when you stop exercising, you might get a drop in force. So we followed up on that and we kept the potassium the same, no potassium challenge, and just gave two acid challenges. So each one is 20 minutes long. When you recover, there's a little loss of force. You rest that muscle when you do it again, huge loss of force. And these are, you know, just measuring the relative amount of force. Here are the raw traces. You can see how it's lost. So in fact, in this mouse model, this acid challenge is a more consistent way to trigger a loss of force than a potassium challenge, interestingly enough. So this is a very, very strong effect. And we're very excited because like, we're on to something about where does weakness come uh, after exercise. So we did this same test in all of our mice. So we start at normal pH, which simulates rest. All the muscles are happy, 100% force. Oops, sorry, it's hard to do this. Then we simulate exercise for 30 minutes and then rest. So we're studying normal mice, our hyper-PP mouse, and our two hypo-PP mice. Only the hypo-PP mice get this very, very consistently. Now I know, and maybe we can sh have a show of hands in the room, people with hyper-PP definitely have exercise-induced weakness. I'm seeing heads nodding. What it means to me is, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I'm sure there are a lot of things that are happening at this exercise-related weakness. We just happen to have identified one that's interesting in following up on, and the follow-up story is going to be relevant to hypo-PP rather than hyper. So I'm sorry to the hyper-PP people. Again, this is just the way the biology turned out. Um, but we, we now have something that we can look at. So what we wanted to ask is, this thing we're measuring in the dish, how similar is it to your attacks? So here we've got one similarity. It's severe, uh, two similarities, and it comes after the so-called exercise. Well, what about do you have to exercise for a long time? 
So instead of being acidotic for 30 minutes, we did it for brief periods of time. And you see after a brief exposure, there's very little loss in force. And the longer you're exposed to these acidotic conditions, the more severe the loss of force will be when you recover from it. So that's telling us something important. What it's saying is that whatever is going on, the risk that you're creating from being acidotic while exercising takes a long time to develop, minutes. That creates certain restrictions on the kinds of mechanisms we can think about for why you're getting this weakness, and we have, we have some ideas about that. So there's this definite uh, phenomenon of needing to be there uh, for a long time, which what I'm told by individuals is, yes, if you exercise for a long time, you're at greater risk of having the post-exercise weakness. The other thing we did was <coughs> ask about the warm down phenomenon. So what we're doing here, it's an artificial situation, you know, it's, it's in the dish. We're creating acid situation. The muscle tolerates that fine, right? When you're sitting in those um, acid conditions, uh, you're fine. You're not losing force, right? But then we have a, a really abrupt recovery. We drain the bath and replace it. So in two seconds, you're completely recovering from your exercise, if you will. And you all have told us that if you keep moving, you can ward off an attack of weakness, or if you start feeling that you get up and move around. So the question was, well, maybe if we didn't have such an abrupt termination to our simulated exercise, we could prevent the loss of force, just like you do with your warm down. So that's what this is. So I'm taking um, two muscles, the two muscles from the hind limb and, and doing them in parallel so you can have a, com a direct comparison. Because as you know, when you try to provoke symptoms of periodic paralysis, they're variable. So if you go have an exercise McManus test, sometimes it's abnormal, sometimes it, you know, it can fluctuate. So we always have to do the control. So what we're doing is both of these hypo-PP muscles are being exposed to acid. That's the exercise. Here's the degree of acid. And if we recover, which is shown in the bottom, if we recover the pH very, very quickly, both muscles get weak. Now, one muscle in blue, we're recovering very, very rapidly, and sure enough, it gets a big drop in force. But the purplish one, where we recovered more slowly over like 20 minutes, didn't, you know, it looks like maybe it's not so bad. And if we recover really, really slowly, we can completely prevent an attack of weakness from coming. So what this means to me is there's a lot of credence in what you've been telling us all these years, that warming down is important, it's protective, and at least with the mouse model, and there are a lot of limitations in the mouse model I acknowledge, but the mouse model is telling me that you might need to warm down over a prolonged period of time. It might be tens of minutes. Uh, it's not just, oh, you know, I ran a half marathon, and now uh, I'm just going to walk around the track twice and warm down for two minutes. Um, you know, I think if you stop and then you start to get symptomatic, you can get up and, you know, walk it off again and so forth. But what this is telling me is that it might take a while. I'll put something else out there that uh, really should be done in a controlled trial, but you guys could do it. <laughs> so what we're doing here is varying the carbon dioxide to simulate the acid load. And what we're saying is you don't want your acid recovery to be too quick. If it is, you're at risk for weakness. And actually taking caveus or acetazolamide causes you to waste bicarbonate in your urine and you become acidotic. So maybe that's what's protecting you. So you can do a trick to make yourself a little acidotic, which is breathe into a paper bag. So you guys go home, exercise. If you feel weak, breathe, repeatedly breathe in and out of a paper bag, not to the point where you're asphyxiated, but just to, it'll build up the CO2 and tell me whether that helps. I'd really be curious to know about that. And you can participate in advancing the science. Um, so take home message, warm down slowly. Um, that's the exercise. We have seven minutes. I think we should dedicate this all to questions. And um, I can, at another time, we can set up, I can talk about these other topics. So questions. Would, would acid and the diet have a similar effect? 
So there are different ways to become acidotic, metabolic versus respiratory acid. So controlling the amount of CO2 or acids you take. Possibly, the thing is your body is really good at trying to keep things constant. So that's why you take, have to take truckloads of potassium because you keep peeing it out. And if you did it in your diet, um, not acid per se, but there are other compounds that you can take that really affect the balance in the kidney. Um, I would say the best way to do that is with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors rather than thinking about being able to achieve that through dietary means. Um, in my, I'm not a nutritionist, but that would be my first take. Louis. Steve, that was terrific. Um, this young woman uh, to my right raised the issue of magnesium. I, um, you know, I've heard, I, I hear lots of things from patients, and when it's a one-off, I'm left saying, well, you know, if it helps you, you know, great, but it doesn't make any sense to me. I've never heard that before. <clears throat> but magnesium comes up over and over, and some people, I, I can't remember, uh, I'll have to go back to the files and see, you know, is it high magnesium, low magnesium, but, but a lot of patients have said that manipulating magnesium, I think taking magnesium helps them, and I'm just curious if that, that's come up over and over so many times that it begins to sound like something that might be, you know, really important. Can you think about that at all and how, how sure. that fit into this story? Sure, so magnesium is really interesting because it's present in your serum at about one, one and a half millimolar. So it's less than potassium, but it's substantial out there. It's about as prevalent as, a little less prevalent as calcium, free calcium in your blood, in your serum. And there are a number of effects. One of the things, all of these ions with two charges, especially magnesium, they're very potent at coming up against the outside of a cell because the outside of a cell is negatively charged with sugar groups. And also some of these channels have negative charges and these magnesiums come and they screen it. They screen the charge electrically. And that influences the voltages that your channels are sensing across the cell because of this screening effect. So I think one big thing of magnesium, it's more potent than calcium, it's screening this charge and it's very well described. There's a good paper in uh, neuromuscular disease that magnesium can help reduce susceptibility to myotonia, for example. So you can reduce excitability that way. Magnesium partially blocks this leak. So a partial block could be just enough. You know, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. So little, little effects could be important. And then there's a long history in medicine that if you're weak or if you have electromechanical dissociation of your heart, first thing you do is give an amp of magnesium right, and see if it works. And so clinicians try that. And in the old periodic paralysis literature, there are sort of partial responses to acute administration of magnesium. So there may be something there. In all of our mouse experiments, we're using a standard extracellular solution which contains magnesium. So we haven't to date systematically varied it to see whether it's, but it's worth looking at, definitely. I'm so sorry. Uh, the, the hotel has like a really fixed schedule about setting up for lunch and whatnot. Yep. So I'm going to ask everyone to write, please write down your questions because I don't want you to forget them. And we will maybe like after lunch, you know, address whatever. them again. But like, yeah, just because they're going to yeah. get us. In so I'm here till noon tomorrow. So we can, whatever. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs>